What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Mastery Podcast. Now, a familiar face to many and a new face to quite a few of you. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Jordan Shallow to the Mastery Podcast. Good evening with you, Jordan. Good morning to you, man. Thanks for having me on. I feel like this is this is a this is like my hand is stamped. This is an exclusive group. Uh, a big, big fan of the podcast and the, and the coaches and people you've had on. So it's uh, it's cool to be on this. Well, no, do, do you know what? I mean, I, I'm delighted to have you here because um, you know the one thing that I have respect for in this industry is walking the talk right and uh you know you've been in the trenches you know you're a prolific figure in the industry now and a lot of people a lot of people may not know you just like they don't know me and this is why we do these kind of networking opportunities and podcasts to kind of introduce ourselves to our networks and and ultimately we're both in this game to help as many people as physically possible so in this episode i'd love to kind of delve into your ideas your philosophies uh you and i were introduced to each other uh, through um, a mutual great friend, Ben Pukolsky. Um, you were doing a, a, a tour uh, and basically holding Ben's hand, right? I mean, the guy he's looking after. So he basically oh, wanted a bodyguard for his world tour. Is that correct? Yeah, he's a menace. It's absolute, you know, these 4.30 a.m. wake-up calls. He's out of control. <laughs> no, and I love it. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I followed you on your tour um, with him and my team, by the way, are seriously excited. Let's, before we say anything, I mean, we, you know, you'll, you'll hear the podcast guys and I know you'll absolutely love Jordan, his, his, his theories, his methodologies. Um, and uh, we are, I'm going to hit this right now. The boys are so pumped when we can get you over here, right? So you were supposed to be here just about two weeks ago. So what the hell have you, what the hell's happened, Jordan? Why have you just blown us out? <laughs> oh, you know, I got a little busy with things, international borders and governments, yeah. and pandemics and UFOs and things like that. But I just, I just couldn't be fucked, honestly. Like you, do you know what? Do you know what the problem was, guys? I remember um, body power in the UK, and they were trying to get Conor McGregor over, and it was more to do with his entourage, right? And this guy. <laughs> You, you, you have such a big entourage, we just couldn't bring him over. So we're going to have to wait till he drops a few of these traveling kind of entourage. But hopefully with this pandemic, you're wondering where I'm going. Um, the pandemic itself has obviously thrown a spanner in the work for our education, for Jordan's education. We have a private seminar at Nottingham at M10 and my team are really, really looking forward to having you there. So um, hopefully the uh, travel restrictions and uh, ability to speak on mass, you know, because it's, I think it's not necessarily travel as much at the moment. It's more getting a larger group of people together and all working together. Is that, are you finding that a big problem? Um, yeah, well, honestly, though, we've been put up in Australia since things really locked down in March. So it, it hasn't been too bad here. I, I would arguably say in the developed world, it's probably the best place to be. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, watching what's going on back in Canada with, you know, I had probably 12 dates, rescheduled indefinitely into 2021 now um and that is the big thing like i could get home but there'd be no way still in a major like a major city like toronto we haven't gone into the stage three yet so everything now is just kind of pushed online and pending you know pending sort of government uh, like lifting of restrictions well we'll we're, we're looking forward to, to having everything back to the degree of normality soon and, and having you over now um for those of you who don't kind of know a lot about jordan this this is quite a funny thing okay because jordan and i have spoken on on uh your podcast very kindly and we, we've done a live together and communicated back and forth on email when i kind of first wanted to know who jordan was uh, i went on his website and um i uh, i look at this burly dude and you guys on youtube watching this will see the stature of the man and I went down his website and I went, Jordan Shallow, um, four times CrossFit Games athlete. And I went, fucking what? Are you kidding wrong me? <laughs> Must be the wrong website. Well, it's, your, it's, it's the co-founder of Prescript, right? Yeah, that's my other, that's the other Jordan. That's <laughs> so not I, me. I scrolled too quickly. I, this is so funny. I scrolled too quickly and I went, you know, you, I'm going to do it live with him. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about his, his background. And he's a CrossFit athlete. <laughs> and so I was like, this is going to throw me. Because I'm going to like, how are, you going to, how are you going to introduce this? But I then rolled back up the page because I was too finger happy. And realized that, um, you know, you are chiropractor by trade. Am I right? 
and yeah. powerlifter by athletic. Uh, is your sure, athletic hobby? Hobby. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You've just I mean, you, you, you've just started lifting the baby weights, right? <laughs> Sure, I stumbled. I stumbled into it. <laughs> well, listen. I mean, you know, I'm I'm fascinated to kind of just delve into kind of your backstory because um, one of the things that I remember listening to a, a great um, mentor of mine, and he said, "If there's one thing that we can do in our our career, it, it, it's biographies." You know, because it's one thing listening to what people are teaching right now, which we is invaluable to our career, but. I, I'm fascinated by journeys because every trainer that's listening to the Mastery Podcast right now is on their journey, right? So if they don't necessarily start thinking about, okay, when I'm going to start talking to somebody and I listen to how did you get to where you are and what formulated this journey, then that's the reality of what it takes to become successful, all right? And the Mastery Podcast, we look at all multiple areas, you know, business, marketing, coaching, um, and, and personal growth and development. So you're kind of entry into chiropractic, uh, you know, treatment, et cetera, in your profession. How did that all come about? And how did it kind of merge into kind of the powerlifting endeavors? Yeah. Um, so I started studying, believe it or not, history and political science in a university in Southwestern Ontario, right out of high school. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Loved lifting weights, loved playing hockey. Um, and then, so I went to university, I was, you know, had a, I'm good at rope learning. I could memorize things very well and I have a good memory and a good working memory. So history, I like the content. I still read the subject matter, kind of follow politics and read a lot in the history, in the history space. And just got kind of, honestly, what it was for me at the beginning and the big driving force out of it wasn't the content. Like I love the professors. I love the courses, but it was just the people. Like I didn't have like a connection with anyone in any of the lecture halls. Like they were all very much like down the PhD route, master's route. They wanted to be professors or researchers. And like, there was just no connection with the people in the room. So I was like, I was really kind of at a loss. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. It was two years into this, uh, this double major and was kind of like, well, you know, I really like lifting weights. Like I don't want to do anything else but lifting weights. You know, my mom was quite concerned that like, you know, you're not going to make a living lifting weights. And um, so I had a client at the time, I was a personal trainer and he was a chiropractor and, you know, he helped people, people like going to see him. He was kind of like the town guy that like everyone went to, went to see, you know, he drove a Range Rover. I thought that was really dope. And I was like, I fucking love Range Rover. So, and I asked her to talk to him. I was like, yeah, I was like, what's like, what was the process? Like, how did you, how did you get into this? And he kind of explained the academics behind it. And I started looking into some programs and I, I just, said screw it and I dropped all my my uh, study in history and poli sci and I, I packed up all my shit and I moved to Toronto which is about four hours up the road and started a kinesiology program with the sites then set on after completing that going on to chiropractic so did that and and it's funny it's so weird like I was, I was thinking about this today actually um, like the and I think it's why I like traveling so much is the best decisions that I've ever made are the ones where I just drop everything and go and I don't really think about it because I picked up from Windsor, moved to Toronto, just like, all right, I, I live here now. Didn't really know anyone. Did the same thing when I went to graduate school in, in chiropractic college in California. Had an opportunity, jumped at it, packed up my suitcase, didn't know a soul, moved out there. Um, and then fast forward, you know, the, I lived, lived and worked in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so just south of San Francisco, kind of like the tech capital of the world. Uh, so I went to chiropractic college. Again, just loved lifting weights, man. And like, you know, people would use the gym like fellow students uh, going through the program would use the gym as a means of like networking, right? They would go into the gym with like an agenda. And it's like, I went into the gym with an agenda. I was like, I just wanted to get fucking huge. I was like, that's all I wanted to do. I was living in California. It was so far removed from where I came from. Never thought I'd ever see California in my life. I was training at a Gold's Gym. Not the Gold's Gym, but a Gold's Gym. But in my mind, it was Venice Beach all day, every day. It's Gold's Gym. And <laughs> it is, yeah, and in, in California, so I, I um you know, I would just go in there and train and, and over the years and training my way through school, I, you know, was able to build a fair amount of trust with the people around and met some cool people in the gym. One guy just happened to be like probably one of the strongest powerlifters in the state at the time who was friends with a very prominent powerlifter kind of in the, in the powerlifting world, his name's Dan Green. Um, so I would lift with this guy named Bill Newman. It was became like an integral catalyst in my life. And, um, but just met him at a squat rack and, he, he introduced me to Dan. Dan was having kind of some body work issues and, you know, as one of the all-time world record, all time world record holders in the 110 kilo and 100, 100 and 110 kilo class in powerlifting, 
he had some logistical issues with finding practitioners that could really kind of deal with his frame and his strength and, and understand so the sport actually, as well i suppose yeah and that's and that's where a lot of i think a lot of the a lot of the treatment a lot of the experience just came from being able to approach it from an athlete first right the last thing i could tell this guy to do is tell him to stop lifting weights i'd be laughed out of the door and he would either go suffer on his own or keep bouncing around the system until he found someone so um that was kind of my first i guess kind of foot in the door um simultaneously met a dude at the same gym a who's a bodybuilder named craig caperso again another integral catalyst one of the nicest guys in the world Craig was big in the industry, bodybuilding.com, sponsored by Cellucor, pulling six figures off a supplement deal, yeah. really kind of showed me the ropes of what was possible. And I was like, what the fuck? And everyone, the same thing, right? Like everyone was kind of knew who he was and he was around the gym and he was still very actively competing, just shredded to the nines. And, but I, my agenda was like, I, I, I wanted to be the biggest guy in the gym. So while everyone was like taking pictures. I, I remember the day going up to him. He was on an incline bench and I wanted to use it. And I pulled like the ultimate meathead, like, hey, that was your last set, right? Like, just like the get the fuck off my machine move. And we've been friends ever since. And that kind of got me more into like the content creation space and then working with Dan. Uh, I mean, it's a bit of a convoluted spider's web as I think back on it, but I, I was working with Dan simultaneously through graduating. And then I got a job at Apple's world headquarters in Cupertino, California. So I was a corporate chiropractor in the corporate wellness center um, on campus at Apple's world headquarters. And then I would go in and work with Dan just because I thought it was so cool to be able to work with someone like this. And then it would kind of an exchange of services went from there. I would hang out after and we would train together. And, and then I would start to be able to see like it put together kind of like through a clinical lens, like watching him move and seeing the issues he was dealing with. And like what a, an incredible opportunity to be able to see someone of that mm. caliber. There's really of not course. many, you know, there's a handful of guys in the world that can, can move like he does. Um, so I was just a sponge, man. I was just trying to soak as much up as I could. Like even with the treatment side of things, like I was very kind of green. Um, I was working at Apple and gained a lot of experience very quickly in a corporate setting like that. And I was seeing 250 patients a week, if you can imagine what that would look like. Wow. Um, and so from there, uh, you know, we struck up a really good relationship with him and he kind of offered me a space in his gym. So I had like this cushy six figure Silicon Valley, like white picket fence, Apple corporate chiropractor gig, like the meat had made it story. And, you know, it was an awkward phone call to have with my mother to tell her that I quit my job to open my practice at a powerlifting gym. Um, and that was kind of it, man. Honestly, from there, it's just been one, it's, it's been one, you know, good fortune seized opportunity after the other for the past like five years and just saying yes to the right people and saying yes to good people with good values. And yeah, it's, it's a convoluted tale, man. I've, I've done, I can't even count how many laps of the globe now. I don't, I haven't had a home in two years. It's, it's, when you say journey, that's definitely uh, in retrospect, when I have to spout it all out in like, you know, a couple of paragraphs, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. It, it is, but also it, phenomenal. Uh, and, uh, you know, having watched even a short part of it so far, um, you're, you're a man certainly on a mission, but also it, it's the one thing I see with you is just this purpose and this, and this passion for what you have is, is just, um, the energy behind you right now. I, I can see that, you know, and I, I talk to coaches so much about, you know, your purpose, um, and the kind of mission that you have, um, is the thing that inspires and drives you every single day. And I see that with you, you know, you just said you're getting up at two forty in the morning and, uh, you know, I, I, I remember speaking to a great mentor of mine and he just said, you know, of course we have days when we're tired, but, but you have more energy when you're inspired, you know, and if you, if you finish each day as inspired as when you started, then you know, you're finding your purpose. Right. Um, now I just want to talk to you about Dan Green and this environment that you found yourself in, because you don't attract the likes of Dan Green to talk to you if you're not doing something that, uh, kind of puts you in the space to be able to talk to these people. And I know a lot, a lot of coaches are developing their careers. Um, and, uh, you know, when I first met Ben, there was one thing that I said about, you know, meeting Ben Pekulski, which was, if I want to meet people in my, my space, I've got to be worthy of having a conversation. I've, I've got to get them to, to almost um, uh, want to have a conversation or at least have something to offer them um, and, and so I, I spent many years kind of developing my physique, developing my knowledge and, 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 and behind the scenes to be worthy of having a conversation with these people. 
Um, is this something you've ever had at the back of your mind that in order to position yourself in any field, such as strength and condition, powerlifting, strength and conditioning or anything, you've been on a purposeful journey, not just meet these people, but can you see the correlation between obviously what you've done from a sporting endeavor and educational endeavor to now being able to know all these people around the world? Yeah, it's, I don't think, I don't know. It's hard because I don't want the wrong message to come across, but you know, it, you definitely start to see where, you know, in, in my example, like being stronger than every other car, not to like you know, blow my own tires, but like Silicon Valley is not really a strong place outside of the people that I trained with. So being the strongest chiropractor in San Francisco is not necessarily hard, but it wasn't also my goal. Right. Like, and I think that's something that's so that that's an undertone. Like if you go looking for it, you'll never find it. Yep, yep. But if you have to ask, you'll never know. And if you know, you need not ask. Right. So I think for me, it was, it, it's just more of a passion thing than anything else. Right. Like that's what, you recognize in other people and like it's it's almost easier with strength and physique development because like you could be in a room with someone who has a passion for music and unless you know beethoven or bach or you know coltrane comes on like you're not going to know this person has a passion for 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 music right mm -hmm. with us it's like you, we, you don't look like us by accident right like you see you're and it's proof of concept i think of a lot of things that it takes to pursue what you want to do like you have to sacrifice a, a lot like in some cases everything to like you know how many times did you say no man i can't i gotta go to the gym right and it's written all over your 20 inch arms and your 56 inch chest right so it's i think it's it's integral now and it's something that a lot of people want to glass over because it is hard but it's the proof of concept like it's it's it shows that you're at the very least experienced which in itself is a form of evidence and a rare and i think a something that should be protected and sought after piece of evidence because it's phds are a dime a dozen i could, mm -hmm. I could swing a dead cat and find a phd like i don't mm -hmm. i don't it's no hard they're not they're not an extension anymore they're everywhere mm -hmm. minimum level almost coming out of school for any kind of career that you're not making yourself as a master's right so now all of a sudden it's like okay it's a differentiating factor but it's not it's not driven insidiously to put you in the room it's a consequence of you just being driven by what you're passionate about mm -hmm. no that, that, that's so true and i think that that in itself is you know i remember speaking to ben about this and it was if we have this mentality of at least being five times not better, I don't like the word better, it's very contextual, but at the end of the day, being, being in a position that's uh, ahead of those that you want to either educate, inspire, or support. And I think there's a big challenge in the fitness industry is that there's a lot of coaches not taking their own development and their own training and their own journey seriously. They're taking their education seriously, but they're not actually applying what they know, what they know to themselves. And what are your thoughts on coaches not not utilizing their their body as a canvas? And I'm not talking bodybuilding here, Jordan. I'm not talking you know powerlifting here. But you know, when you see in teaching, and we're going to get over to your methodology in a second, do you see a big carryover between the coaches that you're teaching who are not really applying what they know to themselves and their ability to be able to articulate what they know? Yeah, it's, it's tough, man. I think it, it's going to be hard to have the conversation around the current state of the industry without talking about the pros and cons of social media. And I think that's definitely a con, yeah. right? Because you can get online clients, right? Like I was always told and from some of my mentors and even to this day, like people that I have the highest amount of respect for is, and we chatted about this, is about being famous in your hometown, yeah, right? And I think like, you know, I think there's a certain entitlement that comes with social media that, you know, you don't see the free hours. Like I still work for free all the time. You know, mm -hmm. you would argue now that I do, I, I charge more so I can work more for free. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think a lot of people, you know, think as they peer through the, you know, the windows and iPhones of the Joneses and they, they see a very curated, you know, dystopian reality. It's, it's tough for people to, to file in line in the queue and, and there is a queue and i think a lot of people want to just they want to sound smart be right and they don't aren't necessarily worried about helping people and i think that's that's when the, the message gets skewed i think to with what i do especially now almost moving exclusively online with covid uh, we've been able to self-select 
just with the message that, you know, is kind of how I approach everything. Like I'm kind of straight from the hip, kind of a no bullshit that we're lucky in the sense that the coaches that we get are very much in the applied space. And, you know, those who, who try and just pair it and parody uh, kind of need not apply. Um, but it is, it is tough, honestly. Like it's, it's an industry that I thought I was too late in when, you know, I started a podcast and Instagram and all that. Oh, geez. It's Instagram has been a seven year pursuit. Now the podcast has been about four. Mm -hmm. I thought I was too late to the game. Right. And, and I think you always feel that way. So I think as people getting into it, right. I, I can understand the urgency that's created that mm -hmm. forces you to make decisions, but if it forces you to make a decision outside your value set in long term, it's not going to be a truth that you can, you can hold up. Um, so I think the only way to know it be a truth is to go through and experience it. Right. Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent. And I'll be honest with you, as you just said, the, the social media world is in itself, if you're not in control of it, forcing you to try and act quicker and, 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 and jump through these hoops. And you and I both know, you know, you've been under the bar many years. You've been educating yourself for many years. You've been networking with people many, many years. And then similarly, you know, I've done a lot of my time in the trenches, whether it's developing my physique, developing my knowledge. And there's one thing I've always said to myself is so long as I'm moving forward, that's the primary thing for me is I don't, I'm not, I'm not bothered about time. I'm bothered about, impact that I can make uh, and also progress that I can make. And I think that's a, you know, a lot of times people are looking at how quick can I get to where I want rather than acknowledging that the thing that they actually truly want to be known for, nothing can take away from the time it's going to take to get there. You know, no matter how much you've got social media. Yeah, it's tough. Social media gives you the following, gives you a, salt, a, 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 a false sense of people being with you like i love the saying if you want to go fast go by yourself but if you want to go long you know bring people with you uh so i think that's that gives a again it gives a false <laughs> sense of progress it's not necessarily linked to our bottom line it doesn't mean you're i know plenty of people with massive followings and they don't they help a couple of their sponsors that pay them peanuts for their for their post but that's about the only people they're helping which yeah, exactly i think you know staying true to the true to the value set is probably the biggest thing that's going to keep you on track well listen we touched a, t a little bit on kind of the, the business aspect there, but it's not why I wanted you on here. And, and we kind of moved down that way naturally, um, but I'm going to pull it back in line. Your pride, your passion, um, you know, your business, you developed with your you know, founding partners, um, the prescript model of coaching uh, and education, um, kind of looking at this model of mobility, stability, strength, right? Um, and I'd love if you can, please, to explain to people who are not familiar with the model, how it came about and what the kind of philosophy around uh, Prescript is. And then I'd like to kind of start and delve into kind of how we apply this as coaches and what are some of the missing links to what you've seen, which caused you create the Prescript model. Right. Uh, so the, I mean, the Prescript model of mobility, stability, strength is it's really just a model based off first principles, which makes it uniformly apply, like applicable, which I, I, I didn't want to come out and create a system. I didn't want to come out and create, you know, uh, like GBT or something like that, where this is how we do it. And if it doesn't work, we need to fit a, you know, a, a square shaped peg into a round shaped hole or anything like that. So, you know, it was very much just a way to simplify first principles as I saw it is training around you know applied biomechanics but there's a little bit of neuroanatomy in there as well and then anatomy so you know we can we can look at a textbook or wikipedia and we can know these origins and insertions and things like that but that doesn't really do us much good right that's as much good as knowing that latissimus dorsi comes from the greek word lattice which means wide like okay that's as equally as as tangential and arbitrary as as knowing that it, it inserts on the floor of the intertubercular groove of the bicep or whatever the hell um, i think that's right i hope that's right otherwise the rest of it's going to be a moot point um so a lot of it was just you know working in a clinical setting in a gym 
you know, the, it was overcoming language. And I think that's one of the most important things. And one of the things that we teach most, uh, like right out of the gate with all of our courses is getting on track with the language, right? There's a, there's a quote that goes, uh, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So a lot of people are just limited by being indoctrinated with the wrong nomenclature around training and injury risk management and all this. So, you know, the word mobility is, is, is almost lost all meaning as is, you know, the, the, uh, sorry, the definition of like the word function. And and stability like all of these things have been bastardized so our first approach was you know it is it is mobility stability and strength but it's it's a uh, it's almost i don't want to say an algorithm or a heuristic but it's it's a it's an order of operation right yes, so if we of think course. of like mobility stability and strength they are prerequisites to one another in order to get into an unstable position right i need to have the active range in which to do so like my shoulder is extremely stable as i sit here at my kitchen table right but if i put my hand over my head and you know this is where most people are like oh i have poor shoulder mobility it's like okay you know well, well what's after that like why is your shoulder um, immobile well you're advancing into positions that that are decreasing the amount of structural stability or the ability to resist force afforded to us by our skeleton and our and our ligaments and things of things of that nature and then as we advance into these positions we have an ability to override the incapable or the lack of capability of our structure to stabilize that joint with our function right that's why we're blessed to have a teres minor and a teres major and a sub subscapularis and an infraspinatus and a rotator cuff and a serratus and a lower trap and a rhomboid and even like a bicep tendon that kind of helps out as well and the labrum and all these things so you know it's just kind of unpacking most people's common perception around tightness around weakness and starting to apply the right language right someone would someone would often come to you know into my clinic and say I have very tight shoulders. I've been told I have tight shoulders. And my immediate thing that I would put in their mind was you don't have tight shoulders, you have unstable shoulders. And that changes it because tight shoulders meant I needed to stretch, right? Where another physical therapist or chiropractor might go, oh, you don't have tight shoulders, you have a weak rotator cuff. But what does that do? That inception's into your mind. Like yeah, you know yeah, how to yeah. get strong. Fuck, you really know how to get strong, right? And a lot of my athletes basically self-selected were, were, were strength athletes or, or, you know, they were they were football or rugby athletes. So, you know, if I told them, hey, your rotator cuff is weak or your shoulder is tight, they, they know the answer. It's like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I've just put like, oh, you need to stretch a lot if it's tight and you need to do rotator cuff strengthening stuff if it's weak, right? So problem solved, like, no problem not solved, right? Because that's, I think of what we need to delineate first is, and the most important thing to understand is that stability and strength are two separate adaptations. Right. Stability is a very, and a lot of people, if you don't know muscle physiology and myology and, and, and neurophysiology, it can be tough because a lot of people think that muscles are dumb. Uh, it takes, and I don't want to go too far on the offensive, but it, it, is, it, is, it is troubling for me to have to unteach principles taught by people who don't necessarily understand the nervous system because it's tough, right? Like it's very easy to create a mechanical tensegrity model around the body. That's, that's, that's kind of an easy task to perform. A lot of people get to the borders of the nervous system and then they kind of close their eyes and go, well, nothing to see here. It's extremely complicated. So, you know, through this process of, of using our muscle spindles and relaying a reflex that, that it causes a, a, a tension around the muscle and it's quite a long pathway if anyone's interested, it's called the dorsal column medial lymniscal pathway pathway goes up to your thalamus through your medulla into your internal capsule through your corona radiata and, and um, into your somatosensory cortex where it happens to be where pain also resides um, so it's a really important concept from a neurological perspective to understand but that's going to be the system that tells you that you're tight right we as approach these positions of instability structurally where our bones are not juxtaposing in a in a fashion that gives us a lot of surface contact right now it's kind of up to us and our function with the, with the shoulder being the rotator cuff right being the primary with the serratus around the scapula and the lower trap then moving down into the pelvis we start to talk more about like the role of the transverse abdominis the core the adductors the glutes the piriformis and so forth right but what is everyone here right you go in with a shoulder injury you have a weak rotator cuff you go in with a low back injury you have a weak core you go in with a hip or knee injury you have a weak glutes right so what do they do right rotator cuff strengthening with bands or cables which is you know there's a place for that sure but it's not mm -hmm. the end game right core strengthening what are they, so they go into the little bird dog exercises they're doing their little curl ups and shit right and they're doing their little clamshells love that love me a clamshell like just the dumbest fucking thing i've ever seen 
and it's just it's it all comes down to the language whether it was a, a lack of understanding of first principles of neuroanatomy or muscular muscle physiology or whether maybe it was an oversimplification to help explain it to a client because they didn't want to say the world word dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway and they ah, it's just eh, it's just weak i don't know just go just go and get out of here um but understanding that you know our goal if someone is say you know, someone is hypermobile or, or hypomobile or tight, we need to use means in which to bypass that inhibitory circuit in the nervous system that says, hey, don't let this advance into that unstable position. And we need to kind of trick that because a lot of people do the same thing, right? They go into the gym, they stretch, then they start training. It's like you're overriding a system that's meant to be there. It's stopping you from getting in that overhead position. So you can't go do, you know, the military dumbbell press with the 50 kilos. It's stopping you because your delt says go, but your rotator cuff says no, yeah, right? Yeah. So you stretch and you tell your rotator cuff to shut up and you tell your delt to just go and your delt's like, oh, okay. And then here we have strength outrunning stability because the rotator cuff is meant to resist force while the deltoid is meant to exert force, mm -hmm. right? So doing the cable strengthening thing that's not going to play up you know your arms at your side but your rotator cuff is meant to stabilize as you approach that full overhead position of that press where your structural stability is not so, so it's like you do the rotator and then you're going to go into a press right yeah it's it's just not specific right that's yeah, like yeah, me yeah. trying to get better at playing baseball by practicing synchronized swimming like how yeah. can a, a strengthening exercise with my arm at my side carry over to when the rotator cuff has to be reactive as yeah. I use my delt to press overhead. So it's just, it's just takes, it takes a little bit of principles from clinical theory. It takes some critical thinking, some practical application, and then mobility, stability, strength was born as almost a, an order of operations mm -hmm. in a way to start to addressing human movement. And we can do that. We work peripherally through shoulder, hip, and spine. The approach, uh, shoulder and hip being our peripheral hubs of stability, right? Getting the language away from weak rotator cuff and weak glutes around unstable rotator cuff, unstable scapula, unstable pelvis, unstable glutes. And then the central hub of stability being the spine. Spinal instability keeps us away from doing crunches. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we want to make sure that we're always leading on that, on the leading edge of making sure our stability is, is ahead of our strength. Right, that we're always showing subjective improvements of stability, which are then followed by objective improvements of strength. Right? And this is, you know, that's our peripheral, that's kind of our level one model, and then our level two goes a little bit deeper into the, into the pelvis and rib cage and the dynamics around breathing and human function and all that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's simple, it's not easy, right? And we've had, we have a great friend and mentor that has, has said that to me many a time, and, I, and it rang true when developing, and, or not even developing, honestly, in a way looking back on and trying to explain to people what I was doing, right? I just, I just started doing stuff. Like I was seeing 250 patients a week and, you know, every 15 minutes I had, not by my choice, but by the structure of the company I was working for, I had a new way to practice. And I think a takeaway for, for coaches is, I, heard, I remember hearing it, not really knowing what it meant. And someone said to me, like, look, you need to practice how you want to practice. And I thought, I thought that meant just do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, yeah, practice yeah. how you want to practice. But it's like, no, like the, the habituation of practice, like iterate how you want to practice. Right. When I, when I mean practice, I mean, when I go into the clinic and I'm actually treating a patient, they call it practice for a reason. Right. Because I am practicing. It's, it's iterations. Right? It's the Bruce Lee thing. Right. Like I'd rather I'd, ra I, I'd, I'd rather face a man who knows 10,000 kicks than a man who's done one kick 10,000 times. Right? So every time I go into that office, it's the same kick, but it's a different iteration. Mm -hmm. And we see this in business. We see this in we see this in learning. And it just happens to when I was you know, coming up with this model, just it the hundreds and thousands of iterations of treating patients or training athletes or training myself, right? If I can throw my own personal experience into the mix, I really get to up that number because I've been training six days a week for 15 years. So I think understanding the iterative process and understanding the importance of iterations uh, it really is for what allowed me to retroactively look back at the process or systems way of thinking. Again, I don't necessarily like the word system because it, it definitely puts a lot of onus. What we teach from a first principle standpoint puts a lot of onus on the coach, mm -hmm. which gives them responsibility, which gives their job meaning, right? If, if I teach a system and that they run, they can step back and be like, well, it didn't work. It's Jordan's fault. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck that. I, I, fuck that. Also, this is how your body works. And also it's an isolated system and they don't then start thinking outside because our, we talk about this a lot in our education and we talk about toolbox. You know, your toolbox, it, it's utilizing the most appropriate thing at the most appropriate time for the most appropriate person, but then having a framework 
that you can kind of work around or to. And the interesting thing you said is kind of like, I think there's a lot of fitness professionals that get into the industry uh, or even are in the industry for quite a long time. And it's like, let's just do it and let's just keep doing it and we'll get there. Right. And then they keep doing it and they get broken a bit and then they don't get there. And then they just back off a little bit and then they go back to doing exactly the same thing and they don't get there and they back off a little bit. And the funny thing is here is even coaching kind of on the gym floor, it's like, well, now I'm a personal trainer. I'm going to go on the gym floor and I'm just going to keep training my clients. And because I'm training my clients and I'm writing a program, they will improve. And the funny thing is, there is so much that goes on in the background of building not just a successful personal training business, but the the kind of uh, the, the person, the customer service and all the aspects of, of developing a successful personal training business that a lot of trainers miss out in terms of the delivery, the professionalism, the service standards, the, the, you know, it, it's a brand and it's a business. There's multiple components to it. So when you then get in the gym and you say, well, I'm going in there to just lift, it's, it's, it's like anything that we do. There's multiple components to everything. So when, let's say, for example, we have, and I want to talk to you about this, this kind of general population kind of idea, because People are coming in the gym for weight loss. They're coming in the gym for fat loss. And of course, primary number thing is get nutrition sorted out. Let's, let's um, you know, f- focus on some fundamental habits. Let's get, get people in the gym. But when we're seeing kind of a lot of people so-called not moving well, and we want to program to get progress as well as start addressing some of these kind of mobility and stability issues. If you were starting to look at kind of like this general population model, and we can kind of move into the physique of bodybuilding and strength training kind of uh, area a, a little bit, but I wanted to kind of have your, your thoughts on this. Your mobility, stability, and strength model, does it end up looking at, at across a, a workout and a program kind of, of course, a, over progression, but how long would you be spending on mobility and stability with kind of this general population market when we know that there's a lot of people with this huge amount of mobility and stability issues before you actually get them into the training arena? Right. And the first thing is human beings are incredibly resilient, which, yeah. is, which is something we need to remember. And there's been somewhat of a uh, indoctrination of the therapeutic world into the training world. And I know a lot of people who, you know, they want to work in the rehabilitation space, but like my, the the best rehab coaches in the world are strength conditioning coaches for professional athletes that aren't hurt. Right. So the idea that you want to sit around on blue foam blocks and use yellow therabands and play in the sandbox is like, that's not what rehabilitation is. That's not Mm -hmm. what injury prevention is. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of, you know, pseudo therapist coaches that are, are taking off what I consider to be like, the, the hat of, of a profession that would actually get something done and make change. And they're putting on a, a hat that for a specific population in a therapeutic realm, that's very self or that's very selective and very, um, and very rigorous in their exclusion criteria can be helpful, but isn't helpful for most people. So a lot of clients or a lot of trainers, they want to, they want to feel uh, like, you know, superior, they want to feel like they're, they have a greater understanding of the human body by, you know, creating this fear mongering, like, no, we need to work on all this stuff before we touch a weight. It's like, exactly. you know, to a certain degree, that might be true, depending on, you know, what weights you're trying to touch in certain positions you're trying to load that, you, you know, that could and be at the end of a very long runway of progression for a particular client. Um, but I think the, the worst thing you could do is, is to hesitate with working in their, their within their current capacity. Right. So there is kind of a, a, a movement of fear mongering that's like, oh, until we get our breathing mechanics right. Until, exactly. It's like there's a process of like I, I like to think of there's a psychological principle called circumambulation. Uh, it's basically I mean, it's kind of used in this idea of like you're, the human psyche. But essentially, it's you're, you're taking these eccentric circles starting wide. And as you go up, you narrow towards like a perfect program or, a, or or an improved system right so we start and our and our and our circles are, are very wide away and then the point is like this this perfect you know the perfect posture perfect execution perfect technique perfect rest periods perfect nutrition perfect exactly. lifestyle perfect habits and we're way off the mark but we're moving which is that step number one we're fucking moving and if we're moving we're moving up Right. And then as we go through this iterative process, again, there's that word iteration, this iterative process, and we change and we learn and we grow and we adapt and we optimize, we start to come up and now all of a sudden we get a little bit closer, right? The technique Mm -hmm. starts to hone in. So there are things like, you know, from as far as a takeaway standpoint, 
with mobility, stability, strength kind of being this overarching first principles umbrella in which systems can live. Um, we look at real active range versus passive range, right? And we start to draw an outer limits is like, look, if we don't have the active range to load there, this is not going to be a position we load in a, in, a, in, a, in a parameter that's not externally stabilized. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. And I can know a lot of the influence in the UK education space comes from a certain ethos around training, which can leave people just sitting on machines forever, which I think is, is a detriment to the trainer's career. It's a detriment to their brand. It's a detriment to their clients, right? So I think we should touch on this as well, Jordan, while we're doing, uh, not, not right now, yeah. but we will. I think it's an sure. important thing to discuss at some point, right? Right. So like if we think that like, you know, someone doesn't have the overhead range of motion, it's close, but it's not perfect. Someone might just destine them to, um, you know, horizontal pressing forever. Yep. It's like, you know, you know, you don't need to, you don't do it. It's fine. We'll just horizontal press on a machine. It's like, well, excuse me one second. Um, um, still there? Yep. We're good. Sorry about that. Um, so they might be destined to a horizontal press on a machine forever where I think what we can do is what we can, sorry, what we can do is we can use the outer limits of their active range. It's like, okay, we can work within these parameters unloaded, right? So we can work within this range of motion, um, sorry, unsupported. So I can say I can do, um, I have 120 degrees of abduction of the shoulder. It's like, that's yeah. not really going to be enough to do an overhead press, but we can do lateral raises. Maybe we can do our tricep extensions here. Yeah. Maybe we do rope cable or cable tricep extensions in this position. And we start to improve the underlying mechanics of the shoulder, the thoracic spine, the scapula, the rotator cuff, and things like that. And then at the meantime, we're still able to work. Maybe our presses are going to be, if we want to go overhead, we could probably do that. We're not going to do it with a barbell or, or a dumbbell. We're going to externally stabilize. Because if I can't get into a full overhead press position, from a mobility standpoint, which will be defined as active range, I know based off that information that there is no way I can internally stabilize the joint in that position. Yep. My teres minor, my infraspinatus, my subscapularis has no experience in that position. Therefore, it has no strategy to resist force there. Doesn't mean we can't load there within reason. If I'm in a seated overhead press machine and I'm within a certain range, and this is where like kind of that coach's eye comes in. I don't mm -hmm. have perfect overhead range of motion, but I want to load someone on a machine. Sure, absolutely. Totally safe because we know we don't have the internal stability, but we're augmenting that with the external stability of the machine. So being able to look through this sort of third prism, third eye of this prism and be like, okay, you know, most of the time we just look at strength and mobility right? The super strong guy doesn't have a lot of mobility. It's like, there's, there's another piece to this, right? It's not a line. It's kind of this, this prism, this trilogy of, of adaptations that we need to make. So I think the biggest thing we can do is, you know, not limit our client's ability to load in certain ranges. And there are, there is an ethos of training that goes, you know, you never load outside your active range. I'm sure we've all done it. We get on the leg press, we try and pull our knee toward our chest. We go, Oh, I, I don't have the active range to go any yeah. further. Yeah. So they just do partial leg presses, but it's like you're on this huge throne where your back and spine and pelvis and hips are totally supported, yeah, yeah. right? So what a great tool to be able to introduce a, uh, an attenuated stimulus into a deeper range of hip flexion than in a totally safe environment, right? I wouldn't have someone in that, in that position go ass to grass with a squat when now the environment is totally externally unstabilized, but in this very safe environment, we can utilize machines as a stepping stone to getting bars on people's backs in an expedited fashion. As long as on the background, we understand that, look, this leg press, this shoulder, this overhead shoulder press, these machines are, are taking away purposeful, purposely taking away that, that internal stability demand of the rotator cuff, of the serratus, of the adductors, of the glute med, and we're, we're delegating it to a machine. So we need to take those moments and we need to put them elsewhere in our program, right? If we want that to be a barbell squat, if we want that to be a dumbbell overhead press, right? So we can, we can understand that, look, the function of the rotator cuff is to resist force. Maybe we start with like a landmine press and then we improve thoracic extension. Maybe we get a kettlebell bottom under press. Now, all of a sudden, kettlebell bottom under press, unstable load, unstable position. We start to improve our mobility by down regulating that, that crutch system that our nervous system casts our limited range of motion. We start saying, look, when we stretch into this position, then we stabilize this joint. 
by isolating the rotator cuff and having it be reactive rather than creative, training its function rather than its action, now all of a sudden our nervous system isn't inhibited by en entering into these ranges. Once we sort of unlock that range of motion and we could prove a subjective improvement of stability using you know, unstable means, kettlebells or single leg movements for the lower body, now we have a foundation we can build on. Now that shoulder head or the shoulder overhead press machine can maybe go to dumbbells. Right, and that that leg press maybe can go to you know lunges into squats down the road. So there's there's frameworks in which we can look at exercise selection, and it, it, and it's incredible for your clients because it creates such a long runway of progression. To to co coin a phrase from one of our coaches, Killian Hamilton, I really like this idea where if you start with a squat day one, where do you go? More weight forever? Like no, no, no. Like your your clients like novelty. They like new challenges. They like little victories. They like to overcome. Right? You start with the squat, that's, that's, that's the top of the hill. That's the precipice, right? That's, mm. that's, that's the pantheon of exercises. And it's like, there's been no journey to get there. Um, so this model allows for a really, a really interactive training environment, a lot of progressions, you know, and to, to, to sample off of Ben's uh, language around time, distance, and load. Uh, we can use progressions of unstable to stable or uh, stable to unstable as another sort of uh, means in which we can start to alter our training stimulus. Yeah, and, and you know that point. I've actually written this down while, while I was, you know, you were talking to me. It is, you know, that limitation that a lot of coaches have is, well, I got my client to hear, like, what do I do now? Um, and I go, dude, like, I've been training. I was training people for seven years, and there was this progression from this instability to this level of stability to this introduction to single leg movements to this introduction of fuller range movements to this introduction to to kind of like um you know below the knee extension hip extension to a squat and this client was continuing to progress and then you naturally hit into these little challenges where you progress a little bit much come back a little bit but there's always this progression so from a from a coach's perspective and this is quite interesting. You touched on this point. There is this kind of uh, world which we've, you know, and granted, you know, during my coaching, it was easier in some respects because it was all body, body composition focused to say to, listen, let's avoid potentially some of the instabilities and let's fill the gym with stability machines and let's get everybody shredded. And then we know they're unstable. We know we can't get them to squat. We know we can't get them to pull off the floor. We know we can't get them to do this, but they're lean, right? Good job. And the interesting thing is, and, and the funny thing is with my team and, and with the way that they learn now, I go in the gym sometimes and I see the, the variation in the training and looking at a little bit more to do with mobility and a lot, a lot of taking a lot of inspiration from your work. And they're, they're looking at these kind of concepts, you know, until they see you and, and, and learn from you. I know a couple of the guys are doing your course now, but these kind of things that we've never really seen in the gym a lot of are kind of being introduced a little bit differently, but the progression of the client is so much more. And so we've got a lot of this kind of like body composition execution world developing in the fitness industry where it's, everything is just isolated on a machine. We've got a huge emphasis on body composition and getting people super lean that, that missing kind of, space would you take what's your percentage ratio of say machine use when somebody is very unstable through to maybe unstable or more stability focused uh unilateral or, or kind of free moving uh implements such as dumbbells and kettlebells like to, to bring that blend of progression together and give more of a, a kind of sustained journey for your client right and i mean obviously it's going to fluctuate but on on the whole, right, like, and, and let's say an, un, uh, an untrained client or a detrained client is going to be extremely unstable and immobile, yeah. right? This is going to be the client that comes to you and goes, look, I stretch all the time. I do yoga and all this, and they still can't touch their toes. So if we understand the first principles around their limitations and range of motion, we can start to then adequately dose a preparation for each session that'll allow them to incrementally improve their, their active or passive range, improve their flexibility. Then once we're at the outer limits, whatever that day is giving us, we can start to look to improve that stability by means of, and I like how you said implements, right? Because the medium is the message. So you know, a machine can help uh, you know, with horizontal pressing, 
but maybe we go from machine for two weeks horizontal press to floor dumbbell press. You see what we did? We, we kind of, it's a slider, like on a, on, a, on a soundboard or a mixer, if you've ever been on a studio, right? So what did we do? We had totally externally, the stability was way down on, on the machine, right? The output was a little bit higher, maybe trying to build some sort of work capacity while we look to improve the range of motion of the shoulder. Ultimately, that's going to be where we can start to train that instability once we get access to that overhead position. Mm. So we put them on maybe a chest press machine. Leading into that, we look to improve thoracic extension and or rotation. We look to improve some awareness around the scapula. Maybe it's the lower trap. You know, maybe it's the serratus anterior, right? Then we go out into, you know, what's causing us to bias internal rotation of the shoulder. You know, we've already addressed the scap. Maybe it's, we have an issue with the lat we need to inhibit. We have the issue with the pec we need to inhibit. And then, you know, it's fine in early stages for someone who doesn't have the range of motion to strengthen the rotator cuff. That's totally fine. It's a novel adaptation. It's not specific. It's novel. But in a place where someone's detrained, that could be just what the doctor ordered for that first step. But let's say, you know, we follow that up with the chest press. So, you know, in real world, what would that look like? A1, you know, foam roll thoracic extension, big emphasis on focusing on the breath. You know, we're going to try and breathe into the, to the upper part of the uh, upper part of the sternum as we go through thoracic extension. Great. We'll go from there. Maybe we do some protraction planks, maybe like a cat camel, something really basic, mm -hmm. using the breath to improve compression and expansion of the rib cage. Then as we move in, maybe we do a static stretch at the lat. Maybe then we grab a cable and this takes two minutes to do. Yes. And then we go on the first set of chest press and we integrate. All right. And then we, so we do our first set of chest press, get a feel for the movement. We go back on the roller in between sets. We keep them moving. We keep their heart rate up. We keep them working. That warm up alone is it's like, I think of it like a baton pass, right? Like when you watch a four by 100 relay, it's one of my favorite sporting events. The, the, the transition period where, you know, the first runner is passing to the second runner, the baton, the second runner is moving. This is how we should look at dynamics of our workout. Oftentimes we, we separate the warm up as a, its, its own isolated entity of and course. gain no, and we gain no usable data from that as we don't test against an objective outcome. Right. So, you know, three rounds of this thoracic drill, scapular drill, internal rotation drill, rotator cuff strength, moving into the chest press machine. You know, that that's now all of a sudden we do two, maybe two working sets, something that looks like technical failure on the machine. We stop it. Maybe we're higher rep range to learn the skill of just this very basic machine. Then we're off with the rest of the workout, working within our active range. Maybe a, maybe a landmine press would, would allow us to start to change that slider within the workout, right? The landmine, a little bit more unstable, free to move it through more planes. And maybe in a couple of weeks, we move that horizontal press into a, a floor dumbbell press right? Very much externally stabilized because our whole scapula is going to be supported on the floor. You know, our humerus is going to be supported on the floor. It's going to be a partial range of motion, right? And we can build some awareness with this new unstable medium of the dumbbell. Maybe we do two weeks floor press mm -hmm. leading into it the same way, right? A1, we're hitting the thoracic spine, scap, internal, external rotation. A5, floor press with the dumbbell. We go start with five kilos, 10 kilos, 12 kilos, 15 kilos, however you want to progress your ascending sets. Do that for a few weeks, go from the floor onto the bench. Then what do we do? As we improve range of motion through all these integrated bouts of the warm up that we're doing, this, you know, which again is just scaling dynamics. It's passing the baton from here, warm up, workout, go, run as fast as you can. Right now, after four weeks, We've gone machine, floor dumbbell press onto the bench. Your client gets excited, right? Each one of these is a little gold star. It's a pat on the back. It's a, it's a step moving forward. Then we start taking the adjustable bench to me is one of the greatest inventions ever made. 15 degrees of progression is going to increase, you know, shoulder extension. And we're slowly going to go from a flat, flat press to 15 degrees to 30 to 45, uh, you know, 60, 75, 90. And all of a sudden, you know, we just, I just programmed six to eight months of progression in an upper body if you do this and integrate it within probably six weeks, most clients are going to be able to get in the overhead position. You reinforce now on the front end. Look, we're on a 35, we're on a 30 degree incline press, but they can get in that overhead position. No problem. So now what does our warm up look like? Hey, hey, grab a kettlebell. And I want you to just, I don't know, go for, just hold it over your head and go for a walk. Do an overhead carry with a kettlebell. Your rotator cuff is reacting, right? Here we have a center of mass that's deviating under a, a small base of support. Then it maybe turns into like an overhead press or kettlebell bottom under press. Now it's kettlebell bottom under press, maybe a windmill for the serratus, and then you're going into your 30 degree incline press. Oh, I can't get into the bottom under press today. No worries. 
fall back into that thoracic extension drill, retest against that objective outcome. Like, hey, there it is. Okay, awesome. Good. We're doing great. We can show we can access that end range of motion. No problem. We could stabilize that end range. So we have mobility. We have stability. There are your dumbbells. Go. Go load. Right? So now all of a sudden, like we've been loading in the overhead with a kettlebell for, you know, anywhere between two to four to six weeks, depending on the progression from 30 to a full overhead. By the time we sit down with dumbbells, we're an absolute ace with this bottom under press kettlebell. We center that deviation of that base of support, that unstable kettlebell to a concentrated center dumbbell over, over, the, over the palm of your hand, over your carpal bones. You're going to be like pressing in a Smith machine. So all of a sudden you have a client that after six months and they walked in and they couldn't even scratch their own back, you got them, you know, fluently pressing overhead and it was just paying attention to a little bit of the minutia, right? It was, it was understanding the first principles as to what was their limitation, right? Rather than beating their head against, beating your head against the wall, trying to figure it out and stretching and stretching and stretching, or just avoiding the problem altogether, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of this systems way of thinking. It's understanding really what the problem is. And then it's laying out kind of this pathway. And it's, and it's, it's literally as simple as that, right? When you understand the first <laughs> principles. Do you know what, Jordan? Just listening to you explain all this kind of, reminds me to something that I tell coaches all the time. How can you not love every day of your job as a fitness professional if you have the opportunity to take people through this many progressions and there's this much that you don't yet understand and this much that if you did understand would make an incredible difference to somebody's life, to your own training. Uh, there's a lot of trainers that are saying, you know, I train people every day, it gets a bit boring after a while. And I'm like, damn. Like, how can this industry be boring? You know, because you know, you've just explained to me and kind of refilled my mind with so many different areas. And I'm suddenly thinking about old clients going, oh, ah, ah, you know, or, uh, if I could go back and train them or even, I mean, I'm going to go and train shortly and I'm, I'm start, starting to think about my left shoulder again and kind of how we can kind of look at the programming slightly different to, to, to my, own, uh, my own injuries. And uh, I, I just... You know, your thoughts on this really essentially is, you know, our industry and what opportunity we've actually got to change people. I mean, you know, just your thoughts to trainers that kind of think, you know, I'm a bit stunted with um, what progression I can make with my clients to this incredible day that we have ahead of us with seven or eight clients in the gym and what difference you can actually make. Yeah, I always tell the story. I had a client when I was at Stanford. His name was Jeff Gordon. And I, I talk about him all the time. He was, uh, he was six foot eight at 72 years old, which is like, if, yeah, he's an unbelievable specimen. Jeff is like, he works a very unique job. He's sort of the liaison to the engineering department. So it'd be nothing for Jeff to be like, oh, sorry, Jeff Bezos is in town. I got to go show him around. It's like, yeah, Jeff, you go. <laughs> this, as, the, as charismatic as the day is long, like he's, he's an unbelievable dude. But at, dude, at 72 years old, you're six foot eight, man. Like, you know, like if you know statistics around mortality rates with a broken hip or a broken rib from a slip and fall, yeah, yeah. look, uh, you know, that's, he's a poster child for slip and fall being that tall, that old Jeff. Well, I remember when I first started working with him, I went through with just a unilateral lower body movement and trainers prior had just put him on a leg press or a quad extension or something like that. You know, a lean dude, like it didn't really work out or anything. Just kind of watched what he ate and walked a lot. And, you know, a walking lunge with two dowels, a quarter of the way down a rep, which for him, like you can't, I think empathy is, is something that I'm, I'm, I'm learning more and more as I travel with my girlfriend, but empathy has become something that's really important. I think in training where it's, you know, imagine what it would feel like. And, and I get this a lot when I work with athletes who are these physical specimens, like imagine being six, eight and devoid of even being 72. Imagine being six foot eight, like the world's not built for me and you, like me and you sit on a plane, we just, we just commandeered both armrests next to us. This is not going to be a comfortable ride for everyone, but I've taken these fucking armrests. But to be six foot eight for, you know, that's one point he was probably oh, six yeah. ten, yeah, right? Yeah. The world's not built for him. It's never has been. He's been on this world that's not built for him for 72 years, right? So I, I think of, you know, in a situation like that, there's nothing more profound. Like I'm in a cool place now where like, you know, we talked, I was on the phone this morning for two hours with one of my guys in the NFL. And, you know, this is his, this is his year for his big boy contract. Wow. And this kid's talking money like I, yeah, I can't even fathom it. That's crazy to be able to work with someone and, you know, then you get paid to be the best in the world. And you're talking in increments of millions and millions of dollars. But to me, like I always think of, you know, I could I could confidently 
go into work on Monday morning and I know Jeff wouldn't be in the hospital. Like I know that Jeff's like, cause now like, dude, by the time I finish, he had bar on his back, ass to grass, 130, 135 pound squat, crushing the leg press, single leg RDLs, hip airplanes, stable as could be. And it really like, it changed the way he approached the way he lived, right? Like a lot of people, rather than walking upstairs, will just get single bedroom home. And they put themselves in the smaller and smaller and smaller box. But I mean, if you look at the mortality rates past the age of 65 of a slip and fall and a broken rib, 50% of those people are going to be dead within six months to a cardiac event, mm -hmm. which is like, fuck dude. Like, but you're not going to get a pat on the back, right? As a trainer, you're, your client's not going to call you, you know, at his 66th birthday and be like, Hey man, didn't die this year. High five. Yeah. Right. And if he did slip and fall, he wouldn't blame you either. But this is like, when you start to think of this level and magnitude, like, like you said, how can you not be excited about your job? It blows my mind. And I, and I think just with that, you know, um, always at the back of our mind when we're programming, working with our clients, at the end of the day, they get pumped up by what you explain and the journey you create before their very eyes. I open my eyes with this visionary and go, do you know where we're going to be? in 12 months to two years time. And they go, tell me this hip pain, this, this strength that you feel, this energy that you want in the morning, you know, it, it, it's all going to be a thing of the past. You're going to be progressing to here. And they're like, really, really? And then you give them these incremental wins. As you said, this pat on the back, these incremental wins as a coach, and it could be stability in the left hip. They've always felt pain in the lower back. It could be the fact that, yeah, they've developed some more muscle. They've, they've, they've looked a certain way, but we can change the goalposts all the time. You know, we can adapt things, change things, and they become a completely different person when they believe in their body, right? You know, watching somebody that suddenly has confidence in their body, strength, stability, and structure it, it is one of the most magnificent feelings to, to gift somebody, right? Now, with this being said, and I do want to talk to you about the kind of physique, bodybuilding, strength, sport world, right? Because I know this is your baby, and I know this is where you love being, but being somebody that, you know, I got myself, you know, I've pretty damn heavy when I, when I was competing and uh, had, had, had a lot of problems. I had terribly bad, el terribly bad elbows and knees in pain probably for about most of the year, right? And with the training that I was doing, regardless of kind of knowing that I had this constant desire for push, 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 bigger, 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 stronger, retrospectively, but the stronger I wanted to get, the more locked in I became in machines. Okay. And probably for the last year and a half, I've spent a lot of maintaining my weight, but correcting a lot of kind of dysfunction. Okay. That I, that I kind of developed over the years. And I think a lot of bodybuilders will know they walk around a lot of stuff that's fucked up. Right. So how do you integrate all this with somebody that's got this, I don't want to take myself off the train of gains to knowing that your gains, your growth and development of your physique is ultimately going to come from marrying some of this with some of that. Right. And it's, to me, it, it's an easier conversation to have now, but it, it just comes down to duration, right? Like, do you want to be doing this in 20 years? Then listen up. Like you need to, you, and it's hard because bodybuilders by their nature with, with sort of like the routes they are forced in by the sport. It, it's, it's a very instant, not I don't want to say instantly gratifying sport, but you can make incredible changes in 16 weeks. Yep. Right. Like, there, there are things that are done in bodybuilding that are, are from the outsider's perspective, extreme, the insider's perspective who know kind of the ins and outs can be done in, in a very safe manner. But it's like, if you enjoy this process, wouldn't you want to enjoy it for 20 years? Like give me, give me 10% of your attention and I'll give you an extra five years in your career, an extra 10 years on your career. Right. So at a certain point, do you love it enough to pay attention? Right. Cause if you don't, and that's where I, and that's how I throw the gauntlet down at the feet of guys I work with now. It's like, Oh, I don't want to do this. This is stupid. It's like, then you really don't love bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. You don't because you're not doing what's necessary. Doing mm -hmm. what's necessary. Isn't your motivation Monday or your, the grind includes Friday post yeah. doing what's necessary is understanding that, look, if you want to be the best, you're going to have to be around for the longest. And we see this man. Like I, you know, I go, I pay attention to the Olympia. I, I love like New York pro you know, the, the, the Tampa is 11 weeks out. Like I keep a finger on the pulse. It's definitely yeah. my first love. And, you know, it's back in the day, man. Like I, I had dinner with Milo Sarchev in January and like this guy's got more stories in the Bible because it was the Grand Prix days, mm -hmm. right? These guys are traveling around every weekend for just years after years. Well, it it was a full-time career, right? Yeah. Just traveling and now it's time. fly by night. 
and now these guys like you see a top eight at one show and it's totally different at the next show because there's no staying power because the guys are just they're 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 you know they're trying to just trying to really accelerate the process to the point where they just can't maintain yeah. right so i think that's that's the sort of the first thing and a lot of times if, if it's not that because you know people don't see it like the young kids that are coming up they don't see it because they don't feel anything yet. And it's like, look, man, I've been at this a while. I know what's coming. The elbows, yeah, yeah, the knees yeah. that'll go into the hip and the shoulder. Like, but I go, look, let's just take a look at your posing. Right? So I'll give me a 22-year-old kid that's you know, talking to me about like, how to use these mobility things and tricks and all this. It's like, look, half of it's just in presentation. I remember being at the Arnold Classic in Melbourne three years ago. And a guy's sister, Nino, shoots me a text message from a hotel two doors over. It says, I can't fucking do a side tricep. He couldn't rotate around enough to actually get his hand to grab his other hand. It's like he'd have a hell of a time, you know, posing on that Arnold Classic stage. You can't do a side tricep, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's what gets a lot of people's attention is like, look, here's what's the problem. You got, judges, you got judges down there. The only way you can actually do a back double bicep because your external rotation is so shit is you got to hyperextend your lower back and you lose that definition through your lower lats into your thoracolumbar fascia. That Christmas tree just goes away when you have to be here. You yeah. create a shadow of the stage lights on yourself and the judges can't see you. If you can keep the rib cage down and actively start to externally rotate the shoulders, you're going to be able to present a whole different, a whole different pose. And so that's like, oh, okay, right? That, that makes sense to me, right? And I could show them in pictures. Be like, look, do your back double bicep. All right, here's what you're seeing. You have to hyperextend at the lumbar spine. You have no extension through the thoracic. You have no external rotation, right? These are, these are exercises you can't do as a consequence of that because they hurt your elbows. But the bottom line, like you can't actually, when you step on stage, present the physique you have properly right like the side the side tricep if you need to take one arm and come behind the other and grab the other hand to do a side tricep and you can't do that well you can't pose you can't be a bodybuilder yeah, yeah, right yeah. so this is this is these are whatever the touch point is and it's no different than any other client you know when you're trying to overcome an objection right you know whether it's you know do you want to walk your daughter down the aisle do you want to you know do you want to get into these certain size clothes do you want to look a certain way on a vacation do you want to feel a certain way by a certain time and I just, bodybuilders their touch points are really easy their pain points are really easy it's like hey bro you look you look pretty small you look pretty small in that yeah. pose bro so yeah but honestly it's just it's the same dysfunction patterns we see because they were all at one point you know, uh, an untrained new client or new, new athlete that never got sort of showed the ropes and they were just able to build based off of just genetics and hard work. Yeah. But, you know, it's unlocking that potential of not just growth in the short term, but longevity and growth in the long term. Yeah. And, and we, we see, I mean, I'd love to know your thoughts on this because the, the, there's a lot in the kind of physique and body building kind of a, a area of the painful knees, the painful elbows. Right now, here's the thing. I'll say this to you. Obviously, Ben and I know each other well, and and when I started doing a lot, understanding a lot more of kind of muscle function and uh, and mechanics. I mean, I I was the elbow sleeves, the knee sleeves at every opportunity. Every opportunity, I was in extreme pain. And when I started, if if I'm honest, the, the, I think the easiest thing I'll say to you is training with a load that I could move with my muscles as opposed to training with a load that I could use, that could, I could just move for move's sake. Yes, it was humbling for me to drop my load, but we live in a very much a world where, uh, and it certainly has its huge place because it's proven time and time again with this, we just got to keep lifting more and more and more, right? And there's this kind of trade-off between the, the ego wanting to have more numbers and the muscles actually being able to do that. And where do you sit with this? You're a power lifter, right? So it's it fucking shift the load, right? And I don't give a fuck. It's going down, it's coming up, and I'm going to tick the box. Like, what's your thoughts with kind of, we're not talking jab pop here, we're talking kind of more advanced athletes. Like, where's the kind of, um, you know, power lifting meets bodybuilding meets progressive overload meets, this is going to continually be painful, and you're probably not going to build as much muscle doing what you're doing. Right. So the bodybuilding thing to me is quite simple. It's, do you want to beat your competition or do you want to beat a book? 
It's as simple as that, right? Like a lot of guys, and, and it's old school, it's Dorian Yates is probably to blame for popularizing this. And, and I don't want to demonize Dorian as he's probably one of the reasons I picked up blood and guts when I was 15 years Hell old. Yeah. And I've been a Hell fundamentally yeah. different person since, right? Like he literally changed. I, I, I love going to Venice and we talked about it earlier and they have all the Olympia winners on the wall. And something happened with Dorian Yates. It's just a diff. It's a he, he changed the game. So like, I don't want to demonize Dorian, but like that idea of beat the book and chip it and one more rep is is just to me a fundamental misunderstanding of what progressive overload really represents. Right, overload. It's your over progressive over stimulus would probably be what I would like to rename it as. Right, progressive over stimulus now takes load and weight and resistance out of the pitcher. Right? We want to progressively overstimulate the muscle as muscles learn to adapt, our body begins to optimize and we sort of enter into this part where we're always trying to create this, we we're trying to push allostatic load, which takes, you know, more than just. We just lost you, bud. Just lost you. Is your sound just gone? We just lost two seconds. Yeah, I think it just dropped off your end. How's that? Yeah, there we go, you're back. Yeah, good. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, this idea of progressive overload, right, I think is really, it's from a bodybuilder's perspective exclusively, understanding that you're, what you're reaching for is progressive over stimulus. Right. If we could understand that progressive overstimulus is going to be what helps us grow tissue and progressive overload uh, is going to be leaving us, leaving us chasing arbitrary gains in strength and resistance and hopefully that, that tension carries over into the muscle that creates some sort of stimulus as a byproduct, not a direct, not a direct result. Right. The, the, the progressive overstimulus model, that'll be something that helps us make better decisions. So, you know, with bodybuilders exclusively, they're, they're at such an advantage when it comes to offsetting these, these, you know, the knee and the shoulder and the back tightness and pain, because it's not like powerlifting is true progressive overload. Like you need to lift heavier to be stronger, right? That's just a different pathway of adaptation within the body. So the, you know, the accumulation and the inoculation of that stimulus just has to be there, right? No one can come in and you know hype you up and give you a pep talk like between quarters at a football game, and you can come out and all of a sudden lift hundreds of more pounds that you couldn't lift before. Yeah. Right? So I think bodybuilders are at a distinct advantage in being competitive in their sport long term because they don't have to succumb to this. Like I always make the comparison: look at Dexter Jackson and Ronnie Coleman. Of course, right? Huge, right? And then yeah, Dex Dex swept the Arnold's four years ago. Won every single Arnold's that year. Yeah which yeah. is what, four or five different shows across the world at 46 years old. Maybe if he was 45 at that time. Well, uh, I remember seeing Ronnie earlier that year in a wheelchair. What's the sport, right? And it's like, you know, everyone knows Ronnie's name, but every, now everyone knows Ronnie's story. And it's like, heed these warnings, man. Like to see, to see a kid like Larry Williams before U.S. Nationals under a 900 double squat raw. It's like, Larry, bro, like, have you not seen Ronnie lately, man? Like, and you know, there's a certain level of infamy that people are willing to lay it on the line. But you know, I, I would imagine that the 2,600 pound leg press and the 800 pound for a double two weeks out from the Olympia probably had something to do with it. And, and you know, I, I say that in one breath and then thank him for it because being my YouTube motivation for 10 plus years of training before I would go in and watch, watch someone lift. But I think bodybuilders are in a really unique situation where they don't have to, right? There's, there's a certain, there's a certain um, a mindset behind a, a bodybuilder. There's a certain chip on the shoulder that they like to operate and they like to express sort of their, their, their difference from the rest of the gym by their, by their strength. But it's, it's not necessary. If you're really passionate about the outcome and beating people in competition and ultimately creating a better physique, progressive overload is, is something that, should be seen as progressive over stimulus and taking the weight out of the equation. And, but there are things we can do to offset even in the powerlifting community. Like there are, there are exercises we can do. I, I call them sort of gatekeeper drills. Like if there are certain things that they act as like the canary down the coal mine, right? That if this, this particular movement, if this range of motion, you know, it goes unchecked or untrained or unloaded or it becomes unstable. That's where that canary starts, you know, sucking for air. And we start to think that, okay, some problems might arise. 
right? So, you know, understanding that, look, gait cycle movements, lunging, you know, single leg RDLs, step ups, things like this that express how we've evolved to move. We haven't evolved to move with weight on our back. We've evolved to traverse, you know, large amounts. Like think of, I mean, I think of like, you know, uh, cause I travel so often, how, what a luxury it is. Like I went to the wit Sunday, I went to Whitehaven beach today and I was like, well, I could take a boat and that takes three hours or I could take a helicopter and that takes 30 minutes. It's like, fuck yeah, up we go in the fucking chopper. And like, I think about, you know, settling the West and Lewis and Clark, like we evolved to walk thousands and thousands. Like my grandfather walked across Poland with mustard gas and two swollen legs, like walking is our jam. So in the gym, just understanding that, you know, this is where stability comes back into play. Like I'm not asking for your whole workout. I'm asking you to pay attention to these indicators, these key performance indicators that are going to say, look, the lunges start going to shit. We need to start looking at the, the function of the hips in more isolation. You keep your knees not hurting with lunges. We will, we'll be sweet for a while, right? You know, I want you to be doing pull-ups from a dead hang. None of this lat isolation stuff. We need to isolate and integrate to make sure we can keep this thing on the track. So it's knowing how to dose by knowing how to interpret the data points at the fringes of these functional ranges of motion, full overhead, deep hinge, deep squat, deep lunge, things like that. Mm. No, uh, you know, and, and, and merging all this together, it, it gives a, a complete kind of, as you said, you know, um, framework, as you said, right at the beginning, I love this word. When I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of movement mechanics and uh, do you remember Gary Gray? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, I, I did a lot of his work um 10 years ago um i did his uh, did his did his course and he he used a lot of nomenclature because his his thought process was a lot to do with feet positioning and you know movement drills and a lot of a lot of kind of like function right right so that was a lot of his thing in the day right um i will tell you i i think i said this to you when i was doing a lot of my the kind poliquin. of no, no, no. I did the, the polyquin thing. When I was doing my rotation yeah, yeah. and polyquin, and, and, and that was when Thibodeau was doing his clean and press, and uh, his clean, and, and that's when I thought to myself, okay, there's a bit of this stuff going on, but maybe there's a bit more of this stuff that needs to kind of go, be going on. But yeah. I remember go, that, that kind of nomenclature thing, which we, you, you were kind of talking about, this, let's learn this language. Let's learn this thought process. Let's, let's, let's look at everything as a whole instead of just an isolated, let's get somebody looking good. Let's give somebody a, a lifespan, um, not just athletic, but also general population, which will equal a longer journey for your client, a more enjoyable journey for your client. It certainly, when you look at a lot of the things that you've talked about on, on the podcast today, gives your clients a lot more things to win over, right? Like we, we, end, we have, end up with, a, with as a coach, coach, there's so many, did your weight drop this week? No, well, you shit. <laughs> You're like, oh, what if we were more stable? What if we were more mobile? What if we were stronger? What if we were feeling bad? Like, what if, what if we were progressing exercises? And I say to the guys, you know, progression isn't isolated just to your weight changing. You know, progression is, is, is so many things. And that's what makes the journey of coaching so enjoyable, right? Um, and I don't know whether you, you, your thoughts on that, you know, for, for coaches. Right. Well, I just think if we can start turning over the big rocks we can start a process in which you know the summation of these little victories start to compound on each other yeah right like it's it's one thing to be like oh you know we'll, we'll bust out the calipers maybe once every six weeks and maybe we'll be on a scale every monday morning and maybe we'll take subjective pictures like you said, you know, like you, you tie one on on a Sunday night, but you're taking photos Monday morning and it's like, ah, oh, you look a little bloated. The mirror is not really telling the story. Skin folds, you know, there's, there's inter-examiner reliability issues there. But if we can, you know, if we can really dig to the bedrock of how our shoulders, our hips and our spine, you know, resist and exert force. Now all of a sudden it's like, hey, wow, that, same, that walking lines look better. Like you, you hear, notice that you didn't like stamp your foot on the ground. You knew where you were. You could anticipate. You ad adopted this sort of the sixth sense of proprioception. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. Now, now maybe we'll load it next week. We'll like load it with like a dumbbell in one hand and just see how you go. Yeah. So and we, and immediately okay, your client's thinking about next week. Right. And then there's a, but there's, there's a high five to be had for like the physiological adaptation and the awareness and the new movement, but there's a compounding effect of like, look, that's going to, that's going to defer knee pain around a leg press. That's going to defer, you know, that's going to expedite the process and for us getting to a barbell back squat and, and these exercises that obviously paired with like 
proper nutrition protocol can really start to set like an, a neurological and, and endocrinological, endocrinological or hormonal environment that can really start to drive some serious change. So it's like turn over the big rocks. And a lot of people like just because it's a relatively new concept, not a relatively new concept, it's just a new synthesis of what I think to be one of the oldest concepts in in neuroanatomy around stability and proprioception, this is this should be seen as a fundamental pillar in training because it's going to create and catalyze this reaction, which can begin to compound on itself in a positive manner. Well, so guys, the next hour of this episode is actually going to be about endocrinology, and we're going to move into <laughs> stimulus and nervous system. So, if we're going to everybody go for a coffee now, Jordan and I are going to have a quick loo break, and we'll be back in two. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. It's, but it's it's hard man like this it's it's everyone i i get you want to help but it's you have to like i remember being in singapore and i tell this story all the time and someone stopped me on a sidewalk and said you know hey i'm looking to get to a certain hotel or something and i'm i don't know why they asked me i was probably the person you'd want to laugh, ask the least is i'm clearly not from singapore um I'm about a foot and a half taller than everyone else on the sidewalk um but I look, I wanted to help. My instinct is to help. And I think that's human nature to help, but I didn't know the way. Right. So it's like, I couldn't help that person. If I told them where to go, it'd be more, they'd be worse than useless. They'd end up probably further away from the bar. So it's, you know, there's, there's a certain, there's a certain sophistication to training that I think is necessary and sophisticated things seem simple on the surface, but are complex underneath. I always tell the story about when I worked in the Silicon Valley and I probably told you the story that one of my patients when I worked at Apple actually designed, I mean, my patients designed everything, but one of them in particular designed the, the um, billboard for Apple iPhones, right? So, and I laughed at him and I said, fuck it, that's the easiest job ever. And then there was a white wall behind me. So I took my phone out of my pocket. And I said, iPhone 11, huh? huh? Black phone, white wall. Did I do it? Can I have your job? He's like, you're a fucking moron. I'm like, okay, you're, you're not wrong, but why in this case am I a moron? And again, talk about iterations, right? He goes, we go through thousands. And he pulled out his phone. He pulled out his phone and went through, like just scrolled infinitely into time as he looked at pictures of different orientations and different iterations of this black phone on this white billboard. He goes, see how the light strikes the corner here? Or see how its phone is turned on this angle? And then see how you can see the apple on this one, but you can't see it in this shadow? And it's like, you know, sometimes these work better in like low lights in a, in a an airport bathroom. And sometimes these work better on the side of a highway. And I'm just like, holy fuck. All I saw <laughs> was a white phone on a, on or a black phone on a white backdrop. He goes, exactly. And I started to think about the way I think about programming. All people are going to see is reps and sets, right? And, there, and there's, a, there's a subset of coaches who are worried about the wrong thing, I think. And like, I don't think you're going to derive meaning from your job if you're worried about these things that don't lead you down this pathway to have a lot underneath the hood, right? Like, I don't understand people that buy Ferraris. I love Ferrari. Like a LaFerrari or a Porsche 918 would be so sick. But like, if I drove it, I would have to drive it 60 miles an hour, right? And it's like, but we know what's under the hood, right? Like when we're at a red light and we know like that that's under the hood. And I think coaches should want to feel that way where like, Look, we're both at a red light. We're both dealing with reps and sets, maybe tempo, duration, density, frequency. Like these are the stimulus we, we kind of control in our program, exercise selection, exercise order. But it's a different kind of feeling when, when you start to invest in your education and you're at a starting line with someone and you know that you have horsepower, right? So like a lot of people can think of this iterative process and think about like, wow, like that sounds really complicated. I don't need any of that. It's like, that's fine. But like there's, and we, when we think about this runway, it's like, who's going to have the staying power? Who's going to get there faster? It's going to be the person with the horsepower, right? So, and that's, I understand. And some people it's not for them and that's fine. But like, to me, nothing gets me excited about being able to, like the more concepts I know, the more concepts I can apply, the more people I can help. Exactly. And, and you know what? One of the greatest things that, that I love about what I do is showing somebody what's possible. Just, just we live in a world, in my, in my opinion, that, that, that um, so, many, so many people could achieve so much more if they just went up another level. You know, I know you and I were talking on your podcast about my book the other day, but just that whole concept of just stepping up, just being, being better than you were today, better than you were um, yesterday, today, and just learning a little bit more, progressing a little bit more. And as coaches, nothing more should excite you than going in the gym to help your client 
move that one step further, give them that extra little bit of knowledge, empower them to be better today than they were yesterday. And that for me, it should really be the same as a coach. I don't want to tell people at all, and I'm sure you agree with me, to be me, to copy me, to do what I've done with my physique. I want you to live your life according to the way that you want it to be. But at the same time, you're, you're never going to get anywhere unless you want to know more, do more, give more, and be more. You know? Um, so it's yeah. just an important thing. Yeah, that kind of curiosity is like you always got to maintain it. Because like to, I'm to the point where... Like, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, I want to wake up and be excited about my, you know, my day. It's like, I go to bed excited about my next day. Like yes, everything, and I, I told you about everything. I like, oh, I, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do this. And I'm not wishing my time away, but that, and I think a lot of that has stemmed from just that, that constant curiosity. Well, that's why when you come over to England, I'm doing your seminar because I've got curiosity. I don't care whether I'm doing a lot of kind of business development and education for coaches. I freaking love my training and I love the opportunity at 42 years of age to be in less pain right now and still be a decent weight and still ship weight than I was when I was, when I was deep bodybuilding. And I want to go to 45, 55, 65 and empower myself and then my children and everybody that gets in touch with me. So this education journey is not just for clients that I work with and educating coaches in their first one to three, five years of, of being in the industry, but me. And that's what's fascinating about, you know, being loving your own body is that you can have a strong, stable, mobile uh, and, and happy life and get to, I'm not going to be six, eight, by the way, I'm not going up unless, you, unless your program, can, can you give me some height, by the way? I don't think I'd be doing this podcast if I could. I, I would probably be selling this one on. I'd be selling this one on late night TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing. You, you, you're you're a man with magic and on a mission, but you can't do height, um, and that's fine. I love I love the way I am. Listen, my man. I mean, damn. I I uh, I just I'd love to just keep going. I'm going to save it for when we go for steak when you're over here. Uh, you're not vegan, right? No. <laughs> I think that's, that's folk for itself. Yes. So here's the thing, man. Listen, when you come over here, we, we obviously look forward to, to seeing you and, and having some, uh, some food and catching up and learning from you. But for the, for, in the meantime, right, um, where can uh, coaches find out about you, learn from you, um, and, get, and get involved with what you're doing? Right. So we run a handful of programs right now. Our, our cornerstone program or kind of our flagship is the level one course that I developed. Uh, it's a 16 week. Uh, I wouldn't even call it a coaching upskill program because we do have a fair amount of clinicians, uh, everything from, you know, orthopedic surgeons to chiropractors and physical therapists to athletes to hobbyists to world record holders and, and olympians and things like that it's it's first principles it's not a system it's a systems way of thinking so it's very unique i teach the i teach the entire curriculum so i actually teach the same lecture which seems insane to some people but i love it because again this this iterative process to me just makes it a, a greater challenge and i think a better product every single time so i'll teach the course um, four times a week every like the same lecture but it's not the same lecture um, I somehow find a way to change it and think of different ways to deliver it. Um, so we do that for 16 weeks. Next enrollment is closing shortly, but we, uh, we do wait lists. So this semester will run from August 5th in through till mid November, if I'm not mistaken. And then we'll start up another one right after that. Uh, so next semester will run from November to, um, I want to say mid Feb. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. So if you guys missed the registration for this one, signups uh, and wait list will be on the website, www.free-script.com. And then we'll have a revamp schedule of the in-person stuff, likely, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, before the end of the year, we can make it out to, to the UK. We have obviously Nottingham at the top of our list. Um, we're going to be in Killarney at some point. We're going to make our way over to the UAE uh, with Abu Dhabi and Dubai and perhaps in Amsterdam um, somewhere along in that trip. So if you're in those, if you're in those neighborhoods, we're going to be around there uh, later this year or perhaps early next year, whenever the, the pandemic stuff slows down. Uh, if not, you want to jump on the online stuff. Uh, we can hop on the wait list or you try and sneak in, but uh, we, we suggest that most people kind of start at day one rather than trying to file in a few weeks in. Yeah, of course. Well, listen, it is, um, as it is every time we now speak, an absolute pleasure. And uh, if anything, you know, for those of you that are going through your career, you know, I, I want to bring as 
varied kind of guests on, but most importantly, people that have walked their talk. Um, you know, that's an important thing for me to bring to you guys. And certainly with Jordan, um, he's done that, doing that. And his program, I can't wait to learn from you. I certainly follow a lot of your content online and uh, look forward to just improving my knowledge and, and, and the application of my skills and so do the team. So I thank you for giving your time up. I know it's a little bit later in the evening now, um, but I really appreciate um, your time and look forward to seeing you soon. An honor, man. Thank you.